So when I was asked to, to speak today, um, I thought, wow, um, this is going to be a very challenging audience. Um, everybody is like experts in their own domain and own fields. Um, and we are just the regulator. And very often, we are learning from the industry as well. But, but I thought what would be worthwhile is to share um, a perspective from a regulator. Uh, what's our worldview? And um, yeah, and we see where it takes us from here. Okay. So, not too very long ago, I think digital assets was mainly dominated by cryptocurrencies. Yeah. And um, not too long ago as well, um, cryptocurrency had a, a fair bit of drama, a uh, fair bit of uh, issues with investor confidence, a uh, fair bit of issue with governance. Um, but you find that that's slowly changing. Right? So, so these are just a couple of observations um, from a regulator perspective. So one, cryptocurrencies are now almost as I mean are, are almost going mainstream, right? Uh, they are an asset class which um, a lot will say are here to stay. Uh, it is evident from the number of investors that are jumping on the bandwagon, and these are not just your um, Web three type investors, but really your traditional or trade fi type investors. So that's one. Second, and I suppose you know from our view, a more important point is that the regulatory regime for crypto assets are coming together. Right? So whilst the different regulators in, in the last three years probably took different approaches in terms of regulating crypto assets, you'll find that they are slowly converging towards a set of principles. Right? Global standard setting bodies like the FSB, like the IOSCO, have all come out with their own respective um, guiding principles or policy recommendations, as they call it. Right? And they're basically a set of very, very similar principles, be it FSB or IOSCO, is that if it's the same activity, same risk, same regulations. Right? And you find that every other jurisdictions have now come up with a set of um, either framework or act to be able to have a reach over this particular asset class. So I'll elaborate that in, in a bit so you can sort of see the differences in, in the regulators and how we have all converging. Um, but the third point, which is actually what everyone else is talking about now, is the expansion of the spectrum of digital assets. Um, you find that everyone else is talking about tokenization of real-world assets. Um, Vince mentioned the other day that we hosted our own um, fintech conference in Malaysia. And we had a bunch of... Um, what we call Malaysian's brightest digital asset minds. Um, they are Malaysian founders, uh, CoinGecko, Etherscan, um, Jupiter. And, and we asked them this question, like, what do you think is the outlook of, of this particular market segment? Well, the answer is slightly different from ours, but there are some similarities. Um, they're very excited about this whole tokenization. In fact, they talked about meme coin being tokenization of fads, right? So from jokes to ideas to cultures. I mean, that's one end of a spectrum, but, but the reality is I think a lot of people are pivoting uh, towards using the underlying technology to tokenize uh, a more tangible or intangible asset that could actually be used um, thereon, right? From our perspective as regulators, naturally, it's about understanding how then do we apply what has been adopted within the crypto world in the securities landscape, right? So I'll talk a lot more about that aspect because that's an area we're excited about. Okay, so I don't have to elaborate this. I think many in the room would be very, very familiar with this. Um, there's been a slew of exchange rate funds, um, Hong Kong, Stock Exchange being one of them that recently issued them, right? Um, and I have this argument with my team. I tell them that in Australia, ETFs were out even before USSEC started agreeing or issuing uh, the ETFs. So, so the reality is um, these products are there because demands are coming from institutional or more traditional investors. Even on Malaysian shores, we see a growing number of digital asset funds. And within our digital asset exchanges that are regulated, we're seeing increasing activity that are non-individual in, in uh, particular. So a lot more uh, corporates, a lot more um, institutions are actually investing in our digital asset space in Malaysia. Right. Um, there's crypto derivatives. There's been a lot of interest in crypto derivatives also in the Malaysian market. Um, OTCs, mutual funds, um, and custodians. So again, I think you find that these are growing across. Uh, even in Malaysia, we are seeing our ecosystem grow within the digital asset space. Okay. So, same activity, same risk, same regulation. You find that back in the 2018, 2019, it was pretty much FATF that came up with the um, travel rule. Right, so that basically helped regulators understood where the money is coming from. Right. 
Uh, that's great, and they started introducing guidances, and different jurisdictions have their own set of plans as to when they're going to comply uh, with uh, FATF's guidances. Right? Then you'll find that different regulators took different approaches back then. Right? Some outright ban, no such thing. Um, some um, regulated them partially from AML, KYC perspective, so you'll find some jurisdictions just register them for that purpose. Um, some had went all the way the other way to, to then say, okay, we'll come out with customized, dedicated regulatory regime for virtual assets. And, and very often, some of these virtual assets are beyond securities, right? um, as long as they are digitized representation on, on DLT. So, so again, different approach. Um, and uh, some, like us, uh, took the approach where we say, if you behave like one, you are one. So we took cryptocurrencies as securities. Right? So we issued a prescription order. They are considered securities. And in doing so, we took a lot of action against unlicensed activity happening onshore in Malaysia. And we started licensing um, activities. So we started off with three exchanges. Now we're growing up to five exchanges. We now have uh, four uh, digital asset custodians. We now have a growing number of digital asset funds that I mentioned earlier. So, so the reality is we started doing that, but at the same time manage unlicensed activities onshore. Yeah. And in, in prescribing them as securities, we also then allowed our traditional intermediaries to be able to handle or manage uh, crypto as an asset class. Okay. So that happened back in 2019. So we came up with our framework for trading. So the exchanges existed and worked. Um, then later, we came out with a framework for issuance. So that was our first framework on tokenizing fundraising. Right? So instead of ICOs, we did IEOs, so initial exchange offerings. Uh, they still have to go to an exchange, uh, but the idea is that they are able to disintermediate traditional IPOs still, and they're able to offer in token form. Yeah. I'll elaborate that in a little bit um, uh, of how they have sort of uh, provided a bit of disintermediation in the bond market. Um, we also came up with a framework for custody, recognizing the importance of custody, especially in, in the wake of um, the interesting events around FTX and etc. Uh, so, so we made sure that there is proper segregation of client assets vis-a-vis uh, -vis proprietary assets. Then come around 2021, 2022, you'll find that um, a lot of global standard-setting bodies came out with their respective um, um, principles or policy recommendations. Um, both IOSCO and FSB, both representative of the securities regulator as well as the central banks, uh, came out with very similar principles. Um, in fact, they also came out with uh, guidances or policy recommendations around stable coins as well. Um, but what, what it signaled was a couple of things. One. Um, that there is a need for regulatory reach over such asset class. Right? So a lot of jurisdictions at that time still do not have reach, so a lot of them made changes to their respective areas in order to have regulatory reach, that's one. Second, it's a global product, not a local product. So the importance of regulatory coordination is important. So for instance, in the sense of IOSCO, we not only did look at working out you know, a set of policy recommendations, that we are now working towards how do we better align regulatory um, frameworks across the different jurisdictions. So what's starting now is a working group um, whereby they look at assessing against um, the particular uh, policy recommendations that they came out last year. Right. So third thing that's going on within IOSCO is looking at decentralized finance. Um, so sort of... Um, Sort of breaking down components of decentralized finance, um, that's not a myth that everything is decentralized. Um, sort of understanding what part is decentralized and what part can't be decentralized. And that way, it, it bridges the understanding between the regulator as well as the industry. Okay? So that, that is going to help form the basis of a lot of how other regulators will be approaching um, regulating um, DeFi-type um, products. So anyway, um, going on to RWA, um, I think uh, in the wake of um, um, all the, the news that you hear about cryptocurrencies, um, there, there has been a lot of interest in understanding the underlying technology itself. Um, so you find that there are a lot of experiments. Yeah? Everyone is uh, looking to experiment to see within, if we adopt such tokenization of securities or real world assets within our framework, what, what needs to change? Right. And I think a lot of regulators are also still looking out, watching. 
Um, the general consensus is that um, tokenization of uh, securities are still pretty nascent at this stage and commercially not yet scalable. Where there is products, it's not yet commercially very scalable as such. Um, we believe at this juncture that the current regulatory frameworks does suffice. But obviously, there are inherent risks um, in addition to the normal securities. And therefore, that's the part where I think we're all trying to understand or interact together with um, the market. Right? Um, so I, I, I'm not going to elaborate on, on the many because they're all public information. But I'm just going to elaborate a little bit more about what's happening in Malaysia. We have um, two what we call IEOs, that's our response to ICOs. Um, one of them is Capital DX. Um, so Capital DX recently um, issued the first Sharia compliant fixed income product that's tokenized. Right? And um, its size is roughly about 150 million. Now, uh, maybe just give a bit more context within the Malaysian fixed income uh, landscape. Uh, we have a lot, we, we are huge in terms of fixed income in Malaysia. Right. We're also huge when it comes to Islamic or uh, Sukkot's. But the reality is a lot of them are large ticket size, very, very institutional heavy. So as a result of that, a lot of institutions don't go down to ticket sizes around 100 to 150 million. Right? And very often, they don't very much cater to the retail or individual market. Right? But with KLDX, what they've demonstrated is the ability to disrupt the market. Right? So they're able to actually tokenize a medium-sized issuance of 100 million, this intermediate the bank, investment bankers and the reality is be able to reach out to um, individual investors. Right? So that, that is a change in the market. And uh, we're hoping to see more of such funds. Um, and, and they will have the ability to do um, equity as well as um, fixed income type products. Yeah. Okay. So that's that. Um, and I mentioned earlier that um, you know, at, at the International Regulatory Fora, we find that it is still relatively nascent. There are a lot of experiments. Um, so I guess the bigger question is, what's the value of tokenization? Um, and interestingly, I see Angela Kwan nodding over there because at, at our own FinTech for, uh, event that we did um, recently, we actually had a round table. We had two camps, right? So is tokenization a fad or tokenization is here to stay? And this is within the, you know, the traditional world, right? And it was a very, very heated debate. Um, and, and I think it boils down to a few essence, uh, if I could summarize the, the debate. One is we do not tokenize for the sake of tokenization. Technology works, we know that, right? So the reality is why? Why do we want to tokenize? What's the value um, that we want to see when we tokenize? It has to be value accretive, else the challenges outweighs the benefit. Right? And there are various challenges. Even in the earlier session, all of you have heard um, about how to scale fund tokenization. The reality is there are challenges in interoperability, right? be it um, uh, old system and, and blockchain, or legacy systems and blockchain, or a blockchain-based system, or um, even between um, payment side vis-a-vis -vis securities, if they are not both tokenized, then it defeats the purpose as well. So, so the reality is the challenges are, are high, but they're not insurmountable. The question is, what, what do we look at from a tokenization perspective, such that the benefit outweighs these challenges? Right. And there are various um, literature out there that tells you which are easier to tokenize and not. And, and I, I think if, if I could use a very Asian example, uh, if it's no pain, then there's no gain. Right? <laughs> very Asian. Um, my mom used to tell me that. So, so the reality is there are easy asset classes, like one will argue ETFs, um, public equity. Um, these are all relatively automated, systemized, there are infrastructures in place. And, and if you talk about tokenizing such asset classes, naturally it could be slightly easier. Um, value could be just slightly augmented, maybe you know, immutability, um, the ability to, to go beyond a particular centralized entity could be there. But, but then again, if you weigh that out vis-a-vis the challenges, is there real value in that? Right? Um, but then on the other side of the spectrum, if you look at a lot more pain, you might see a lot more gain. Right? So that's why everyone's experimenting around asset classes like bonds, where you find it being rather fragmented. And in context of Malaysia, very OTC as well. Right? So you have to deal with a mass network of principal advisors, trustees, issuers, bankers, and lawyers and stuff. So the reality is in, in such context, there could be a lot of value in, in putting um, such asset classes on, on the, the DLT. Um, in fact, I think there's been a lot of conversation, even in Malaysia, about tokenizing money market funds. Right? The reality is it could change the way money markets are used. Uh, it can be collaterals. 
right? At the same time, it could be used in repo market and all. So, so the reality is there are values, and, and each different players that have come to us have sort of looked at benefits versus challenges. So that, that's the important aspect, I suppose, in, in all considerations. And, and naturally, it comes with risk. And on this front, um, I mean, I, I do like what the Hong Kong SFC has actually done. Um, they've actually put down what they think are material risk. Right. Um, and, and from that perspective, it's important. Um, at the end of the day, as regulators, regulating um, industry players, it really boils down to what is material. Right. These are just a laundry list of um, risks that you know, everyone talks about, but the reality is it should uh, be contextualized within the product itself. Right. In some aspects, um, people talk about risk of ownership. The reality is it can be managed uh, within a tighter contract and if, if the nature of the arrangement between the token as well as the underlying assets are managed uh, in a more simplistic manner. But again, again, it differs context to context, but, but the reality is these are inherent risks, ownership risks, uh, ownership risk, technology risks, operations risks, and regulatory clarity. Right? Um, that's where um, interactions between us as well as the market matters. So, how do we do it in, in Malaysia? Yeah. Um, so, recently, um, we announced a couple of things. Um, one is that, uh, probably the more important one in the middle, we are actually working with our sovereign wealth fund, Kazana National, to look at tokenizing bonds. Um, and, and, and it's the issuance of bonds. Um, and, and the objective of it is to basically help uh, Malaysia and uh, the Gleeks better understand what that means to use DLT for bonds. Uh, so we are, hit, we are ready to assess what gets disintermediated within the ecosystem. And we are ready to also test what kind of policies need to change on our end. Okay, so that's something we're working with Kazana. At the same time, we're looking at other type of projects as well. It's a bit too early for us to say so, but it revolves around digital identity and stuff like that. So that's also in the pipeline for us. Um, the idea is to look at how we can form a, a useful ecosystem around DLT. Um, second, um, it's a regulatory sandbox. Um, we have had a couple of players uh, approach us and talk about tokenization models, which doesn't quite fit in within the regulatory framework. In the past, it was a lot easier. Everything was market-based, you know, so we stuffed them into our RMO guidelines and they said it works. But, but today, we see a lot of changes in how it works. So we have opened our sandbox. Um, we're open for the first cohort um, to be submitted before April of next year. Um, and the reality is this is us saying that we want to understand and we want to look at how we can facilitate an interim license for you to operationalize within the sandbox for a period of time. And let's see um, if we can license you after that. Right, so that's two. And third, for those simpler tokenization forums where that fall within the regulatory framework, um, the objective is to give a, a simple set of guidance, um, what to look out for, what are the key area of risk. That helps the two-way communication between us and the players. Okay. And that's about all I have to say. Um, in, in essence, our approach is rather simple. It is similar to what other regulators are doing. Um, through the examples I've highlighted earlier, um, as with any regulators, we seek to understand, especially in this area of emerging technology risks, we seek to understand them. Very often you've seen in, in, in um, uh, the 19, uh, 1990 and 2000, we, we have actually looked at issuing um, regulations that, that helps us with crypto, so you've seen that happen. Um, and we are working with our players that are regulated on expanding their suite of products at this year, so, so that's something that's regularly happening. And last but not least, what I've described in terms of innovation. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.